This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. So last week, I, I introduced you to this concept of Calvin's tulip. And um, I'm sure that many, many of you have heard about uh, Calvinism before. In fact, there are lots of churches today that proudly proclaim that they are Calvinistic in their theology. And just exactly what that means, I will uh, help you to see more clearly today. There are five points of Calvinism. Calvin's tulip is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And as I said last week, there's just one little problem with all of that. From a biblical perspective, each of these points is wrong. Dead wrong. Let me help you understand why I would say that. Total depravity contradicts the free moral agency of man and infers that no person can serve God from his own free will. This is one of the things that, uh, that really disturbs me when I realize the millions of people through the centuries who have bought into Calvin's theology. Total depravity teaches that every person inherits Abraham's, uh, Adam's sin, Adam's original sin, and because they have inherited his sin, they come into the world totally depraved. One is born into a world of sin, the Scripture teaches us, but the Scripture teaches us that one does not become a sinner until he reaches the age of accountability. And as I've said before, it's hard to draw the line as to exactly what that age is, but there, there comes a time when we willfully choose to do what is wrong, when we're taught the difference between what is right and what is wrong, and when we willfully choose to do what is wrong, that's, that's the age that we're talking about. We do not, according to the Bible, inherit sin. We are not responsible for the sin of Adam. Now, it is true that we inherit consequences from others' sins, and we do inherit consequences, the Bible teaches us, from Adam's sin. Death, for example. But we do not inherit responsibility for Adam's sin. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says this, The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the sin's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless you become converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Rather than condemning children as sinners, Jesus commends them as examples of innocence. Little children are pure. They already possess the qualities that are necessary to enter the kingdom of heaven. And even though children are born into a world of sin, they have no knowledge of sin. That's what Ezekiel says, and that's what Jesus confirms in his uh, adoration of these precious little children. There are verses in the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 39 is one of them that illustrates the truth of this when it says, Moreover, your little ones who this day have no knowledge of good or evil. You see, it's, it's only when children grow up and become accountable that they begin to transgress God's law and begin to sin. Ezekiel 28 and verse 15 says, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And the truth is, according to the New Testament, we do not inherit sin, we commit sin. 
1 John 3 and verse 4, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So there is no truth in the concept of total depravity. It needs to be rejected by those who want to follow God's Word. We'll look at the, the you in Calvin's tulip when we come back right after this. Unconditional election, the you in Calvin's tulip, is wrong because it says that God predestined the salvation or damnation of every person without regard to the good or evil that, that, that he may do. This is a very troublesome concept also. Why, um, why even try? Why would you ever bother to try to pursue a relationship to, to God, the kind of relationship that the Bible enjoins you to pursue? Why would you if um, God capriciously, arbitrarily, unconditionally elects some and does another? He arbitrarily chooses those whom he's going to save even before they are born and everyone else is going to be eternally lost. Therefore, nothing that anyone ever does to try to, to be right with God, to do what the scriptures teach with regard to salvation, is acceptable. But here's what the scripture says. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Just that verse alone um, makes, makes it a lie to believe in unconditional election. You can't believe in unconditional election and read that verse. God wants all men to be saved, and He's provided a way. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says, And having been made perfect, He became to all those who obey Him the source of eternal salvation. Not um, all those who are elect by God unconditionally. It's obedience. And that's what the Scriptures teach, teach us consistently, that we, to, to be saved, to be in the right relationship to God, we, we must be obedient to Him. Unconditional election makes that uh, foolishness. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 says, Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why would you need to, and it would, it's foolishness to, to worry, be concerned about obeying the gospel if you are unconditionally elected? And that's, that's what Calvin's doctrine teaches, you see. Furthermore, that would place man in a position of being favored. Um, some would have greater respect and adoration from God than others, which contradicts what we know to be the, the truth. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, for example. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. See, that's, that's the truth. That you can bank on that. That's what God's Word says. God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't show partiality. Those who fear Him and want to do what is right are acceptable to Him, are fit subjects to be obedient to Him. And Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, Jesus' words, Go into all of the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved but he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. God wants all people saved and doesn't want anyone to be lost. He does not predestine anyone to be, be lost. The only thing that God has predestined or predetermined is that he will save all of those who are part of the body of Christ. From the foundation of the earth, he has predetermined that Christ's body would exist, and those who are obedient to Him are added to that body, Acts 2 and verse 47. They are added to that body, the, the body of the saved. Every command, every warning, 
Every admonition to obey God found in the New Testament is completely useless if you believe in unconditional election. There's no reason to teach anyone the gospel. Why would Jesus say in Mark 16, verse 15, to go into all of the world and teach if man is unconditionally elected for salvation? You see, this doctrine falls just as the first section of Calvin's tulip, total depravity, falls. We'll look at the third letter in Calvin's tulip, limited atonement, when we come back right after this. Limited atonement is wrong because it says that the blood of Christ is not available to all men. Now here's what the scriptures say, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, speaking of God. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. But we do see him who was made a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the sufferings of death crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste of death for everyone. 1 John 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Limited atonement says that only certain ones have been elected to salvation. And if this is true, the, the, the verse of the Bible that everybody, just about everyone knows by heart, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that, that beautiful verse wouldn't be true, would it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's not true if limited atonement is right. It's God who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. He wants all men saved. That's the purpose for the teaching and the preaching of the gospel. Many false concepts have come in through the centuries that have taken men away from God's plan of salvation, but this one is horrendous. And as I, as I said earlier, it's blasphemy. It's blasphemous to say that the most precious element that has ever existed in the history of the universe, the blood of Christ, could not accomplish God's atonement, that it was limited only for those who were chosen. And, and I want you to think about how clearly the Apostle John paints this picture in 1 John 2 and verse 2, when he says, He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only uh, for our sins, but, but also for those of the whole world. If you didn't have another verse, if there was only one verse that contradicted what Calvin and Augustine taught, there it is with regard to limited atonement. His, his propitiation, his propiti propitiatory sacrifice was for the whole world. And, and the image, here's the image, that's, that's the word that was used, propitiation, to refer to the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. It's the, it's the word literally for the mercy seat. It's the place where in the Old Testament the high priest came in and sp spread the blood of the offering on the mercy seat where they received atonement. And John says that he himself, Jesus, is that satisfactory sacrifice for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. You see, limited atonement falls just as the others have fallen because it's not a biblical concept. And when we come back, we'll look at the I in Calvin's tulip, irresistible grace. The I in Calvin's tulip is irresistible grace, and it is wrong biblically because it teaches the direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of those that God has chosen to save. You see, one error leads to another. If a person who God has predestined to save is totally depraved and incapable of doing what is right, then his conversion 
has to be accomplished by irresistible grace, something that you can't shun, some miraculous direct operation of the Holy Spirit which enables the heart of the person who's totally depraved to be chosen by God and saved. He can't resist that salvation. It's unconditionally provided. Again, it, the concept uh, contradicts what, what we can read in our Bibles. For example, Mark 16, 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, just ask yourself the question, why? If irresistible grace, if God is going to save whom, who he's going to save, why would Jesus say, Go into all the world and preach the gospel? Acts uh, 10 and verse 34, we looked at just a minute ago. Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Irresistible grace. Irresistible grace is a doctrine that has God showing partiality to people based upon whom he chooses. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That certainly wouldn't be true if, if God causes his irresistible grace to fall on some and not to others. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, the, the passage that we looked at just a little while ago, that his, the grace of God might, through the grace of God, he might taste of death for everyone. That's, that's simply not true if irresistible grace is true. Uh, Jesus did not taste of death for everyone as the scriptures teach us according to irresistible grace. He tasted of death for those who God gives that irresistible grace. And the, the next letter in Calvin's tulip is the P, which stands for perseverance of the saints. And it teaches that a child of God cannot fall from the grace of God and be eternally lost. Uh, some refer to this as a once saved, always saved, uh, or uh, the impossibility of apostasy. But we have many passages of Scripture that talk about the possibility of falling away. And, and again, what, what this does, dependent upon the other concepts that are taught in Calvin's Tulip, is it takes away uh, the free choice of, of an individual. And it and it leads some, to some very weird explanations about those who are saved and those who are lost. Those who are saved can be the most deplorable, depraved people on the planet, but if they're saved, they're saved. And uh, it, it can also have those who do their best to obey God and follow the New Testament I as carefully as they possibly can and do all of the things that the Scriptures demand. That person is lost if he's not, if he's not received the irresistible grace. There are many Bible characters who explain to us the possibility of apostasy or falling away. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4, Paul said, You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Hmm. There's a direct contradiction to both the idea of irresistible grace and uh, perseverance of the saints. It has to do with those who are trying to follow another system of justification other than God's. And Paul said that uh, you can fall if that's condition. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I want you to go Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at the context of the statement that is made there. In that context, Paul uses the Old Testament to illustrate how New Testament Christians ought to walk in their relationship to God. They should do what is right and be obedient to God rather than following, following the subjective thought processes of men because when you become subjective in your theology as Calvin has done, then you fall 
and you fall from God's grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said even of himself, But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. The Hebrew writer says, Hebrews 3 and verse 12, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Philippians 2 and verse 12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. These verses are easy enough for us to understand, and they speak for themselves. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. With all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they will believe what is false, in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. My dear friends, we must love the truth above all things. Calvin's tulip is wrong. It's a deluding influence, and we must be people who love the truth so as to be saved. Well, that's about as clear an explanation as I can possibly give you of Calvin's tulip. I hope it's helpful in your Bible study of God's Word. And I, I hope that if you have any additional questions, want additional studies, that you'll look at the references and resources that we have at ScriptureSay.com. If you would like a Bible study uh, in your own home, let me know. We have people all over the state that will come and open God's Word and God's Word alone with you and help you understand your relationship to Him. If we can help you in that way, give us a call. See you next week on What Do the Scriptures Say? Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to ScripturesSay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.